Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Sandy Rosenthal, host of Beat the Big Guys. And this week, we have a more unusual guest on the podcast because our guest is actually in the middle of working on Beat the Big Guys. It's an ongoing dynamic process. Let me tell you a little bit about my guest, Dr. Emma Osong. She is an accomplished engineer in aerospace systems. And while that alone is very cool, the reason that I invited Dr. Osong on my show is because she has just published a book, Unraveled, A Personal Journey in Conflict, War, and Diplomacy. Dr. Osong tells an inspiring story of how her daughter, Praxi, triumphed over a medical prediction that she would never walk again with the plight of the recolonized people in the country of Cameroon in Africa. The people in what is often called Africa in miniature are currently facing genocidal violence in their quest for peace and justice. Dr. Osong shows why human transformation is at the heart of both health challenges and violent conflict. And the reason I understand this is because I read the book. But what right now, Dr. Osan is going to tell you a little bit more about this, this human transformation, and uh, then you all can decide after, after this podcast whether or not you would like to get the book. But before we start, Dr. Osan, oh, excuse me. Hello. Hello, Dr. Osan. Hi, Sandy. I am so glad to be here. I have been looking forward to this opportunity to really get to sit down and talk with you since we got introduced. So this is just as exciting, a bit nervous for me, but you've calmed all my fears. And I'm just looking forward to having a conversation with you. Let's jump to uh, why you wrote your book and what you want to accomplish with this amazing book. Wow. So my book really is a tool for awareness. Let's start there. And why did I write this book? Five years ago to date, the year was 2016. As I said in the book, I woke up one day and my 24 year old, then 24 year old daughter looked at me and said, mom, I don't feel good. And I said, go to the hospital. Do you need help? I don't feel good. And by the end of that day, She was unable to move from the neck down. That's how rapidly her health deteriorated. Her dad had taken her to the emergency room. When I got the call, she's being admitted. She's unable to move and I'm totally disoriented. What's going on? I showed up in the hospital and the doctors are telling us they don't know what's happening. They've run a few tests. And it appears her body, the large muscles are breaking down rapidly. They're breaking down so fast. So a certain measurement of um, what they call uh, the, um, the, the protein in her, her bloodstream showed rapid deterioration of muscle tissue and that she must be evacuated to the only hospital they know might be able to help her. So here we are at Johns Hopkins. And as a mother, I'm thinking, okay, this is gonna go away very quickly. Uh, That wasn't the case. My daughter Praxi laid in bed and could only move the tips of her fingers and wiggle her toe and maybe shift her head from one end to the other. And that would become uh, a long journey for us that lasted the better part of a year. Um, I could never say the story without choking. Uh, my daughter became bedbound, essentially. And um, the next thing was the insurance company said, well, you've essentially reached your lifetime maximum after months of being in the hospital, intensive physical therapy and discharge from one level of care to the other. At this point, I'm not really clued into how the insurance and the hospital systems work, right? So when they see that you have either plateaued or you're showing improvement, they they step down your care. So from intense rehab, you're sent to uh, a, a lower tier rehabilitation or even a nursing home. At first, 
we are so excited at the thought of discharge and we are we, we are i'm looking at my daughter and going wow this is one step and then you would come home the revolving door would start we'll go into a nursing home she will deteriorate and will be readmitted back this process goes on and the insurance says we are not paying anymore and one day i'm sitting by my bed my daughter's bedside as i have been at this time all this while literally taking up a bed in the room with my daughter because i had to be there to assist you see sandy it's only so many um, minutes in a nurse's day they can give to one patient so a patient who's unable to ambulate move is at risk of bed sores when i clued in on that i planted myself there and i'll turn my daughter as she cries mommy can you lift up my leg can you turn me and here's why praxis body was crushing her the dead weight was crushing her so much they were afraid her heart would give up. So she was now on heart medication. And then she would get into full body panic, which can precip precipitate full blown heart attack. So I, I zeroed in to always turn her so she doesn't get into a panic state, which meant I really never left the hospital. Uh, fast forward, the insurance says we're not paying. The hospital says, uh, Dr. Osong, as of today, your daughter is a self-paying uh, client. Bedside nursing is more than $1,000, and rehabilitation and special care now totals to about 3000 sandy a day. And that first envelope that I got was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. I look down on it, and I go, whoa, what is going on? It turns out, here's the part where if there's any uh, benefit out of my book is for any parent there fighting the healthcare insurance system. There is someone behind the desk who does what I call a ministrivia. They are there to prioritize human life over profits. They are not the expert who deny care. So, Thankfully, Praxis doc doctors and nurses were so caring. So her doctor and myself teamed up. We agreed that the only way the insurance would say we deny care. By the way, what I did not tell you was at the very first prescription for my daughter's particular condition, the insurance didn't denied our payment. It took months before it was approved, at which point the breakdown of the big tissues in her body had gone so far down, she was fighting even a bigger uphill battle. But someone who denied care was not an expert in her condition. So they did not know how life and death that particular uh, uh, medication was what is so the name of this condition it's called Emma? necrotizing myositis okay. necrotizing myositis so your body sees the big tissue muscles as an enemy foreign mm -hmm. and they go to attack mm -hmm. and they say we have to get rid of this that's what her body was essentially doing so it's an autoimmune condition mm -hmm. which um up till now there really wasn't clarity as to the origin. So there are three ways you can uh, perhaps suffer from that, hereditary uh, medication in induced or trauma. We kind of clued into the fact that a few months prior to her diagnosis, she had uh, been involved in a head-on collision. So it's likely she had internal muscle damage and her body went to attack the dead tissue and, and everything just went haywire. But anyway, um, Praxis doctors decided that only specialist insurance uh, doctors would be allowed to make a decision on to, uh, as to the kind of treatment that she would have. Was it a rare, is this a rare, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing this is rare. It is rare. And, and, it, and at first it was misdiagnosed. Yes. Or, or not diagnosed, yes. It would, they couldn't figure it out for many, many months. And for a long time, a, um, 
for a long time, yes. So her doctors would call and only ask for a specialist at the level of the insurance to say, only a specialist who I can speak to, who understand why this particular uh, prescription must be approved should be the one authorized to make the decision. You know insurance and are going to hire those very those specialists on their staff to make this decision. That's how we overcame the battle at some level to one, give the right treatment in a timely manner to my daughter, but most importantly, to continue to safeguard her health. health. But that, that battle did not end there because the moment the insurance stops paying, you know the hospitals want to move you over because you're not a paying patient. So that was the battle I fought mainly with the insurance and with the administrative year of a hospital to say, you're going to have to come through me to discharge. My daughter, I can't have her at home. What do I do with her? You're discharging her to die. So that battle eventually ended up, um, we, I, I would say that we fought and fought and ended up with the, um, the courts, I think it's a special court called the uh, Office of Administrat Administrative Hearings, which is different from criminal courts or civil courts. At this point, uh, they're looking to discharge Praxi and I'm saying, she's not going anywhere. I'm gonna take a uh, power of attorney and, and stop this. But as you will turn out, Sandy, after so many, many months of being prodded back and forth, at one day, um, Praxi looked at me and said, mom, take me home. Instead of going to the nursing home, take me home. Um, at this point, I said, if you really mean that, I would. But allow me to talk with these people. Uh, instead of being discharged to a nursing home, this is what we'll do. We'll bring you home and we'll bring your nursing home to your home. That's where I set up and say, whatever service my daughter would have received and paid for in a nursing home, I demand that those same services be in place in my home where my daughter is, including that she's not trapped in the event of a fire, she has the level of care. And I fought and fought and fought months later, my daughter accepted as an adult to sign her discharge papers. And I brought her home with all her services and her recovery from that point um, continued. Before I, I segue here, it's really for any mother out there, if the insurance says no to your doctor, make sure you partner with the doctor and ask the insurance to put the expert on the line who is saying no to your care. That's if there's any lesson for me to give to the audience, that would be it. That's a very but important good, lesson. I hope uh, our, our listeners don't ever need it, but if they need it, that's, that's a lifesaver. Yes. And don't, don't, don't back down. Don't back down. Um, the, the, the upside of this is that my daughter is resilient and literally gave me the courage to stand up and fight. Uh, her determination, her, her outlook with life, even in the depths of her heartache, she was always smiling. The nurses used to gather around her room because it's, it almost felt like a happy place to be, even though she had those moments of sheer terror and pain. So she taught me that in the depths of your greatest challenge lies an incredible power. You just have to tap into it, that resilience, that um, outlook that says, I can do this, I, I can get better. So um, at the same time where I cradled my daughter, Sandy, my social media feed was filling with bodies, death, destruction, military, steps from my childhood home. And I'm going, Lord, the life I left is falling apart, which is alive in my, my birthplace. The life I have in front of me, my daughter, appears to be falling apart. What message do you want me to get from this? 
And, and it is in that moment that I said, I was caught between two worlds. I didn't know at that point what felt worse. The fact that there was a war breaking out in my country of birth that seemed to be calling my spirit to jump in and fight. And now my daughter that I had to care for. But as soon as she came home, she seemed to have given me the courage and the permission to say, so far you've been so quiet, always willing to work only in the background. And it is at that point where I said, I woke up one day, the country I had sung its anthem, carried its flag, was not the country of my birth. So who really am I? And I had to go back to learning about this place. This is where I say, Sandy, we, be, we, we walk, the ghost of colonial past was now in front of me and I had to confront it. And what is that ghost of colonial past? The fact that we had been victims of historical wrong, that is the people of the area of this country called Cameroon, that is Southern Cameroons. We have been victims of historical wrongs. And why? I had to retrace history that had not been taught to me as a young girl, that continues to not be taught to successive generations of young people. So they understand why they wake up and they're a citizen of a certain country and that country is at war. So very to make, to make this really short, we could go back to the, the end of the World War I, where the big powers, United States and the Allied forces, sat at, to end the World War at the Treaty of Versailles and decided to dispossess Germany of all its territories, its colonial holdings, right? Of which a vast swat of Central Africa, including this, the sliver of triangle today called Ca Cameroon, was, was divided. A part of Cameroon was given to the French and another part, which is called the, the, the Northern and Southern Cameroons was given to the British. Now fast forward into Second World War, as it ended, those territories that were called mandated territories became trust territories under French and Britain and a mandate given to them to lead these territories to independence. So the French got its independence, French Cameroon in 1960, January, and Southern Cameroons got its independence in 1961, but opted to join an already independent Cameroon in a federation. But that federation was illegally abolished in 1972. And fast forward in 1984, the only second president since the independence of either the French or the English parts of Cameroon unilaterally declared the country one and indivisible. But you would know, your audience should know that the Africa Union Charter states that boundaries achieved at the time of independence are invaluable. What does that mean? They never change. So Cameroon's boundary was fixed at the time of its independence, even though we joined it in a federation. But in order to keep this, uh, this construct called a one and indivisible Cameroon true in the minds of successive generation, the entire history of the country has been erased and a new one supplanted. So that in 2016, at the time when my daughter, I was cradling my daughter and crying as she is so sick, I'm also crying as I realize that my own relatives, including my brother, who had poured out on the streets, simply demanding that they not be treated as second-class citizen, demanding that French teachers not be the ones teaching the English are speaking, uh, their English speaking children were basic gone things. down. Yes, basic, basic. thing. Uh, and, and if I recall from the book, weren't they demanding like good roads? Good I mean, roads. Basic things. So, yes, I didn't mean Gun to interrupt. Gunship helicopters came down, killed people. Hundreds and hundreds of young students at the university were brutalized, some raped. 
arbitrarily arrested, deported into distant jails in the French part of the country until today, Sandy. My own family member, who's a nephew by marriage, Mancho Bibixi, is languishing in jail, having been submitted to, to a military tribunal and sentenced to, to almost life imprisonment. Uh, just as I said uh, before we got on, that yesterday there was an IED that killed so many people, this time on the government side, right? So there are even more reprisals. We have the case of the Garbo murders. Sandy, your, your listeners should know that what happened in during the Holocaust happens in Cameroon, where an entire family was either burned alive in their homes or their pregnant mothers killed by the Bia regime. Now, if you think what's happening in Ukraine must be decried, then your listeners cannot look away because e equally devastating human catastrophe is taking place in Cameroon and the media is not talking about this. There is no news outlet that carries it 24 seven. The Norwegian Refugee Council describes this crisis now entering its sixth year as the world's most neglected crisis, the world's least funded. Let me give you a few startling statistics here. Uh, and I don't wish to do shock and awe on the listeners. There is total militarization of the Southern Cameroons area. There is what is called impunity crimes, crimes against humanity. I've mentioned the Garbo massacres where nearly 33 people were killed. The Kumba school massacres where young children were gunned down in their classrooms. You have um, the killings just last December in a village, not far, my mother's, my grandmother's village, where 80 civilians were rounded up by the end of that, uh, four were killed. They are decomposed bodies found only later on. You have the, um, the, the massacres in Boya, the massacres in Kiliwindi. I could go on and on and on and on. This past January, just so people don't think this is all uh, a very personally heartfelt thing without any backing. Just this January, the UN's uh, Office of the Coordination of Human Assistance in Cameroon, Yaoundé, put out a report that one out of every two Southern Cameroonians is in need of humanitarian assistance. We don't hear that in mainstream news. We don't see that in the new cycle, that the same suffering of the mother whom I saw, and I, I don't wanna cry here because I feel the pain of those who have to go into bunkers in Ukraine, who have to walk miles to present themselves at the border, who are cradling their sick babies and unable to move. That is what the people in Southern Cameroons are going through and even worse. And no one is talking about it. So, um, and of course, we, with the closure of schools as well. Um, we, uh, our listeners, um, before this episode ends, we will give you tools on what you can do. Or Dr. Osong will give you tools to help. I'm sure by now, um, uh, hopefully all of you are asking, what can I do? And, and there is something you can do. And, um, and Dr. Osong will provide that for you. Um, before the episode ends. Um, Emma, would this be a good time uh, to, um, <clears throat> to, to um, ask a couple of questions about what, what you spoke about? Certainly. Okay. Um, so uh, again, um, I, I, I've already told our listeners that I read the book. It is wonderful. Um, and uh, I, there was many, many ways in which Dr. Osong just, just, beautifully and in, in beautiful prose um, just hit, hit, hit the nail on the head on what you need to know if you want to beat the big guys in your neighborhood. And one of the first things that I noticed is uh, what, what Dr. Osong said on page 73. She said, I'm here to tell you that you've been lied to your entire life. 
no matter where you are in the world, you've been indoctrinated into false beliefs about yourself and the world around you. That is such an important thing. Now, doctor doesn't mean to say everything is false. That's not what she's saying. But things that you uh, take for granted, uh, just assume are true, might not mm -hmm. be. And it's waking up to that and, and, and doing the examination is really critically important. And that's part of your job as a leader in beating the big guys. Um, Emma, would you like to elaborate a little on that? Yes, I certainly will. Our entire life has been one of uh, uh, five things. Uh, I, I call it conflict that lies, conflict that diminishes, conflict that distinguishes and divides and ultimately erases. So we live in a construct called Cameroon, one and indivisible, but the children and subsequent children that will come out of this country would never know their history. And we know without your history, then who are you? So this is being told through the eyes of someone who wishes to push a particular agenda to the point of war. So my book is to say, I live in a country where it is not one and indivisible. It's actually two countries. So that lie has been buried in subsequent erasing of the history that it is. We live in a country where we are told it's a peaceful bastion in the Central African Republic. Let me share with you how peace looks. Peace looks through a hyper-centralization of the government, no freedoms of expression. Now they'll tell you there is because they tolerate it. It looks like the kind where you are considered a second-class citizen in your own land of birth. Now, this is a country where since 1960, there have been two presidents. The current president has been in power since 1968. As Secretary General, till 1975, he became prime minister. In 1982, 40 years since he took on as president. Now, this is a country where France is in fact uh, uh, still the, colo the colonizer of this country. And I know those are such harsh, harsh words, but let me tell you how. Cameroon and France signed something called the Cooperation Agreement. Till today, that is in full force. What does that mean? This is the history you are not taught in schools, that France resolves the right to first exploitation of all your resources. France prints your money, called the CFA, in Chamalier, France, a little town called Chamalier, France. And France makes sure your country's national reserves are placed in the ba bank in Paris. And should you need that money for any developmental work, it shall loan you that money at the prevailing interest rates. This is going on today. So that's the, that's the um, when I say the pernicious tool of erasure, one of those elements of how conflict erases is being used on, it was used on me. It is being used on successive generations. And today we grow up in a construct that we simply take for granted as Cameroon. Meanwhile, it is made up of two states of equal status, both sovereign with their borders defined and fixed at the time of their independence, who opted for a federation. But unfortunately, what we also are not being taught is that that federation, there is no treaty between the two countries because the more powerful French control side that makes up 75% simply absorbed and annexed the smaller part. And when they stand up to protest their second class citizen status, they are killed, they are silenced by force and today by war. And, and this is, um, thank you for, thank you for explaining that more clearly. And this is 
exactly what I wanted to talk about next. Uh, you, you, mm -hmm. you spoke on page 41 um, mm -hmm. that these, these atrocities that you, that you discussed today that mm -hmm. these ne neglect you you make the comment neglected stories of a rapidly escalating crisis float aimlessly throughout the ether largely ignored by most of the world we have at uh, all of us we have finite space for processing our surroundings and that's very true and and that's that's true yesterday today and tomorrow forever on the other hand uh um, you can't let that stop you from your work. And I'm going to um, share uh, something one of my colleagues said to me that, yes, that's enough to make you give up. You know, how, how do you bring these atrocities to the attention of the world where the media is not doing it? They should be. Journalists are doing it, but they're not. And that's a conversation uh, for another time. So, so what do you do? I says, well, something that can be comforting um, to you, Dr. Osong, and it was comforting to me, is in order to be seen and to get the word out, um, imagine yourself in a giant cornfield. All you have to do is rise up just a little higher. You don't have to be 10 feet up or a mile up, just a little bit higher. And, and, and do your job of getting the word out just a little bit better than the, your opponent, and then you'll get seen. So you can take heart from that. Um, but it's very, very true. Uh, it is very difficult to get the attention of mm -hmm. other people. Very difficult, but not impossible. Mm -hmm. I, I take a lot of consolation as I read through your book in seeing the tenacity and just stick with it attitude, right? It's, it's like the little wins. Never before is it true that you should always celebrate the little wins because if you're looking just for the big accomplishment, it's so easy to get disillusioned. Mm -hmm. I, I, stay, I stay engaged partly because it's an existential threat. I stay engaged because of the victims that are my family my villages that were burned, the relative who escaped, my own brother who escaped into Nigeria when the military was coming for him and died subsequently in Nigeria, the nephew by marriage, Manchu Bibixi, who today is still incarcerated alongside estimated thousands of other youths. They could be my son, for God's sakes. The young girls who are arbitrarily arrested, Miriam and Sandra, who today under the platform called Women for Permanent Peace, I advocate for their release. They are simply arrested and facing military tribunal by association. There's the pregnant woman who gave birth in the jail who used to date someone suspected of being an armed fighter. Today, she's a married woman with a family, was picked up while she was pregnant and is still in jail today languishing, unable to raise the oh, 1 million oh. franc CFA for her bail. And she's being asked to give up a land title and to bring a, a, the equivalent of $2,000. Yes, yes. If if my platform was unique, uh, I guess if I had the money, I would put it up for this woman. Unfortunately, I don't um, at this point. So these are the cases where I cannot. So I, I talk about going from couch warriors to social justice. It is, it is not at the level of, say, Black Lives Matter, where you're so powerful, you can galvanize the entire world. It's simply saying it's no longer tenable to sit back and sit quiet or stand back. That however I can, I would use every platform to raise awareness that there is nothing called not in my backyard anymore. Because sooner or later, it will be in your backyard. Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and there's one, one last thing that uh, I would really love to touch on, um, and even though we could go on for much, much longer. And that yes. is, uh, you mentioned on uh, page 97, you discussed how you had the Swiss government and the United Nations are each putting out their own versions of the, of the truth and press releases. 
and noting that yeah. they're happy to start a dialogue that will return peace to Cameroon. Meanwhile, they don't mention the fight for independence or, or separation or, so in other words, you've got all these different truths out there. And, and one of the things that is critical on the path to beating the big guys, at least agreeing on the basic facts. If you don't agree on what are the basic facts, you are not gonna be able to go anywhere. And and uh, and that is it's really important that you 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 bring this up. And for you out there beating the big guys, if if you are um, if you see a problem, it's really critical that at least you agree on the basic facts, and then you get to work on on what you're going to do about it. Can can you um <laughs> what would you what, how would you respond to that, <laughs> Dr. Osan? Simple, simple, Sandy. There's something, as you've just said, the basic facts for us mm -hmm. is the root causes. And there's something I think legal minds will understand. It's truth labeling, right? If you don't call it what it is, how do you solve it? Right. You might as well be right. solving or not doing anything. So right. yes, the Swiss government at the height of this war in 2019 offered its good offices to mediate between now the young boys who have taken up at first machetes, and now they have arms and the government of Cameroon to bring them in dialogue, just like all wars end in dialogue. They believe that they could do so. But unfortunately, they are also not willing, uh, not only the Swiss, the big five, as I call it, whether it's Russia, Britain, uh, the United States and France, France in particular, since that is its continued colony, they are not willing to look this beast in the eye and say, these are the root causes that continue to fuel these sentiments, this resentment in 25% of the people. They are not willing to, to uh, accept the fact that we can't pray away all of our troubles into submission, right? So they are, while saying they would mediate, while the United States and France say, oh yes, we welcome peace talks, they are not putting the necessary pressure on the big guy in it to the, the, the 40 year long serving president to sit down and dialogue with the armed groups that he is now calling terrorists. Remember, these are our children who took up arms when they saw military killing their friends, their relatives, their parents. Today, uh, uh, anyone's enemy can become a terrorist. So, so the, the, the long and short of this here is that while even the United Nation has called for dialogue, it has not put the necessary pressure as we see being put on Russia to bring the parties to sit down and talk, right? And the dialogue addressing the root causes. What are the root causes? The fact that one, it is not a minority grievance between French and, and English people. It's not about using French judges in common law courts. It is the forced annexation of an independent autonomous part of a country that was equal in status into a highly centralized one and indivisible Cameroon. So that is the erasure, the one and indivisible is the current story. The erased story is two nations of equal status and one simply say I cannot live as a second class citizen where you kill me for speaking up and for that we are going to ask to, uh, to, to assume our state as an autonomous part of Cameroon. In the book, um, the, there were several different places, several chapters where you listed calls to action very specific, very well done yes. calls to action. So, yes. um, I, so for those who, um, who um, cannot or, or aren't buying the book for these call to action, where would you direct our listeners to um, calls to action online? So on my uh, Facebook page, okay. Dr. Emma Osong, okay. I talk a lot about the crisis in Cameroon. I also have an, a petition under Women for Permanent Peace. It's w4ppj.org. 
where we advocate for women and the victims on the ground. There is a petition also that you could sign that essentially calls on Pope, the Pope to engage in this conflict. Why? Because more than close to 60% of the population are Catholics. Right. And we believe the influence of the church is mm -hmm. powerful enough to change the trajectory of the conflict. And we are also- and yeah. For the listeners, um, Emma Osong uh, del is delightfully spelled in English exactly as it sounds, E-M-M-A-O-S-O-N-G. Yeah. That's correct. So thank you for having yeah. an easy name for our listeners. Uh, yes. So is there, is there anything out? There is one more thing I want to talk about, but is there any last thing you feel you just have to, have to say before we so wrap up? So there's also this thing of what can I do, right? There, right. there is a bill, there's an HR 556 uh, um, bill granting TPS for Cameroon that has not been passed. We've seen that one is being done for Ukraine in under a week. So we're calling on people to push their Congress uh, a person to pass this bill granting temporary protective status for anyone fleeing Cameroon or who currently is here and undocumented. There's also okay. the, the uh, HR uh, 684 a resolution taken up last year, condemning the crisis, calling on France to use its influence on the on Bias regime to, to come to the dialogue table. So again, writing to your congressperson, asking them that we understand your focus on Ukraine. What are you doing about the world's most neglected crisis in Southern Cameroons? What can you do to also alleviate the suffering that is going on there? So Thank that you. would be my appeal. Thank you, Dr. Osong. And, and I, I'd like to, if, if it's all right, uh, end on a little bit of a lighter note. Yes. I, I, you seem to have a penchant for living in oddly shaped places. So you were born in Cameroon, which looks like a bird, that the country of Cameroon has a head and feet and, <laughs> and it looks like a bird, right? Right. And uh, right, yeah. the, the bird country. I mean, I, I, I've uh, before I heard it called uh, Africa in miniature, I'd heard of it as the country that looked like a bird. So now you live in Maryland, um, uh, in, in uh, the United States and in, in the state of Maryland, which is also very, very strangely shaped. <laughs> so, so, you have an <laughs> so you have an affinity to live in places that have uh, very strange, strangely shaped borders, no squares for you. <laughs> I never thought of all that. <laughs> That's very interesting. I noticed yeah. that right away. Before, before I read your book, I noticed you have an affinity for oddly shaped places. You, well, you know, that, that there's something to be said about Cameroon and its shape. I, while I haven't heard it shaped, uh, talked of as a bird, it's, it's always um, thought of as Africa flipped upside down. Oh, okay. okay. Yes. So if you take it and flip it right side up, it almost mirrors the, the map of Africa. And, I'm going and, to do that. <laughs> and I'm in going. calling it Africa in miniature, uh -huh. um, one cannot help but think about all its contradictions, which is some of the things that I also highlighted in the book. It, it, it can be interesting, and it also has so many consequences. Yeah. So on a lighter <laughs> note, yeah. On a lighter uh, note, that was... Uh, <laughs> but I do not at, at, in any way trying to um, uh, make light Many, of this yeah. crisis. This is a crisis. And thank you so much for bringing it to our attention. It, it shouldn't be up to citizens like yourself uh, to have to do this work. That's just the way it is. And thank you for shouldering this burden. And I'm, it, it's, a, it's a big thing to shoulder. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, so, um, and thank you, Dr. Emma Osong for joining me. And I hope all of you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on all of your favorite platforms. And remember, no matter who you are, you too can beat the big guys. Thank you, Sandy, for bringing this very important crisis to your listeners. It was really my humble pleasure to be here. I really, really want to thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs>